happened, everybody? Uh, Good morning. Sure, as some of you might be able to tell, in Mosley Hall, I'm in the back of the room where the moderator uh, computer is and just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see those of you who are online and glad to be able to turn around and see those of you who are in person here. This is a good, uh, good thing for us to be together. And I'm seeing some more folks come in. Hey, Carl and Tempe. Hey, Tom. Welcome. Um, well, it is, uh, the hour has come. Uh, we are really grateful for the Reverend Dr. Randy Spa to continue his, uh, for continuing his course on the Gospels. And uh, without further ado, I invite you to join in a word of prayer as we begin. The Lord be with you. So with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the Gospels that have spoken life into this world. Thank you so much for the gift of your Son, the living word. Uh, about whom these, these books and these stories um, speak. We pray that this class would continue to offer us a deeper sense, not only uh, an understanding of these books, uh, but also of your presence in our lives as they would guide us in the way that we live. These things we ask in Jesus' name and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you again and welcome. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to see all of you. Always surprises me after I do one of these lessons that somebody comes back. So, so it's good to have you here. Absolutely. It's good to have you here. Um, the handouts that you may have or may not have gotten, uh, basically from last week, they're the, they're the overheads uh, from last week, and we may refer to those briefly. You can take them home with you. Um, I'm not going to go over a whole lot that we looked at last time, but I want to start with just some comments. Uh, the questions. I can't answer all the questions, but I can answer some of them, maybe. And if not, we have some experts in the place that, that we can find knowledge or we can go home and look it up, but it'd be a real shame for you not to have, not to ask your questions or make your comments. Um, I don't want to discourage you in any kind of way from doing that. Um, I was at the poll workers meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, there was something that didn't make sense to me. So I raised my hand and I asked about that. And the lady behind me turned around and said, I'm glad you asked that. I didn't know either. And so it, it may be of, of uh, some help uh, to others uh, to be able to do that. Um, I want to uh, look real quickly at some questions that came up last week. Um, last week, I, I was asked if um, one of the things that we learned last week, and we looked at some of the things that you'll see, uh, some of the archaeological uh, findings. We do know today that all of the Gospels are written in the first century. Now, that's really not arguable, and I shared with you that I would share things that there's so much evidence it's going to be hard for you to argue with, and I'll share with you some things that are kind of my opinion. Uh, I have evidence to, uh, to back it up, but I can't put the nail in the coffin, so to speak. I can't do that, but I want to be able to share those things. A uh, couple things that came up last week. Um, why is Mark the first one written? And that, that is something you can't argue with either. Uh, Mark is uh, the first gospel written. There is so much evidence we can't, uh, you'd have a hard time uh, deciding otherwise with that. And <clears throat> why is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And I took some time this week and looked up the canonization process, which if you get into that, Tom, you need another eight weeks <laughs> uh, and somebody else to teach it because <laughs> well, that is a, a, a huge uh, topic. But, but in the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, the Bible uh, as we know it, the order as we know it was set in place. Um, the arguments have been going on for 200 years up to that point. Um, the church is not under one monolith. It, it uh, is, is in different places, the Syrian church, 
the Egyptian church, the Roman church, uh, their, their churches in all of those areas. And um, there's a little bit of difference in, in, in what they think, what should go in and what not. Uh, I am, if my memory serves right, um, James only made it in by a vote. He just really close to James uh, make it in the canon, the list of scriptures. Um, but the Shepherd of Hermas almost made it in too. And I've never read the Shepherd of Hermas. I need to go back and read that, get up, up to date on that. Um, but there's something called the Moratorian Canon that is 150 to 170 ish in that area. It's in a, something called the Moratorian Fragment. Um, but it has Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the answer to the question is, I don't know who set the order. I don't know why they put it the way that they did. I just, I really don't know the answer to that question. Maybe somebody will enlighten me, but I couldn't find an answer uh, to it that, that uh, made sense. Um, I am thinking that Matthew is first because it's easiest to teach from. Uh, that would be a guess, but I, I really don't know. Do you know how Paul's letters are ordered, for example? Uh, they are all together in the New Testament. They begin with Romans, they end with Philemon. Do you know, does anybody know how they're put together, what the order is? First Thessalonians looks like the first letter of Paul to be written, but that's not the way that it's put together, and that's not given thought. It's just simply from the largest to the smallest, from the longest to the shortest. And if you go back and look, it is exactly that way. And the question of when it was written didn't come up, and I don't think they gave a whole lot of consideration to that at this time either, personally, but I, you know, really don't know uh, uh, exactly. One of the things that was brought up last week that I need to mention again, uh, just because it's going to be important, um, that is something called Q. Um, there is, uh, when, when Matthew and Luke write, and they have Mark in hand, and they're quoting from Mark, but they're also quoting from a different, goss, a different document. Um, the Germans called it Coella. Uh, that's where we got Q from. And there was a, not a gospel, but a list of the sayings of Jesus. A lot like the Gospel of Thomas. Thomas is 114 sayings of Jesus. It isn't what we think of as a, a gospel at all. Um, and we know that Matthew and Luke didn't quote from Thomas. That, that didn't happen. But there's something out there. And we'll refer to that more, more as we go along, especially as we get into Luke. Um, I was planning to get into Luke today. But I don't know that I am. Uh, I might. It depends on how many questions you have here. And I understand we can get questions online. And, uh, you know, wave at me if you have some, uh, if you get them written or whatever. Um, <clears throat> yes. Would that a Apparently, there there's more than one okay. of, of those documents. Yes. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> or give a summary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, somebody has to remind me. I've <laughs> I've not spent my career doing that. Um, what was it a, a a custom at the time to have documents that had sayings uh, of a person? 
it looks like it. That there are, are multitudes of them at this time of Jesus, or at least there's a few of those that we know about. Um, but Mark is the first one to put anything together called a gospel. Uh, well, the word gospel, the evangelion, has been used before as a name, but to put together really a biography. And we talked about it last week. It comes from uh, the last part of the fifth chapter of First Peter, where you have Silas uh, together with Peter, and you have Mark there, and the persecution, the Nero's persecution has just begun. It's the first empire-wide persecution. It's coming, and I think First Peter is written for that. If you read, it talks about the fiery ordeal uh, that you're going to, to encounter, and uh, I think there, there's no real evidence that Peter wrote. Uh, Peter uh, turned to Silas. He dictated his letter. Silas wrote it, or Silvanus. It's in most versions that way. Um, I think Mark turned to him and said, Peter, we need to get this on paper. All the letters of Paul are written. There are these documents that record the sayings of Jesus. Somebody, before things really get rough, uh, somebody needs to put this down on paper, and uh, and that, that's where the that's where I think the God of Mark started from. Okay, I've got that done now. I want to share with you. I want to get off on a rabbit trail a, a little bit, if I can. Uh, and then, and I hope teach a little bit of Mark in the process. Like I say, I was going to get to Luke and I'm, I'm not going to get there today. I'm just not going to get, I don't think, I uh, could be wrong. It depends on how many questions you have. And by the way, your questions, if you're here, I'm a bit hearing impaired. <laughs> so, uh, you know, state those questions loudly. And uh, if I don't make sense, listen, wave your hand and tell me I don't make sense and we'll start again. Um, but that just kind of, it kind of happens. <clears throat> long time ago, and uh, not a long time ago, a year and a half ago, April 19, uh, 2019, uh, I retired as a pastor. I'd been preaching for 44 years, been in the church I was in for 21 at the time and uh, it is the rule or uh, is part of uh, ethics uh, pastoral ethics that a pastor not really come back to stay uh, for a couple of years so i told margaret we needed somewhere to go and uh, we looked around we went to different places and finally i said one sunday morning i said why don't we go to saint mary's you know and we ended up over here and uh, were greeted well, and I knew several people here. I uh, enjoyed Episcopal worship was uh, something that <clears throat> I, I, I really like. And uh, we settled here. And I remember meeting with Tom and telling him that during these retirement years, and they've been interesting, um, that I, I, I wanted to grow closer to God. And I really did. I mean, that was, that was where I wanted to be. But I wasn't right. Uh, because he allowed me then to get uh, in with uh, the contemplative prayer group. And I spent some time reading to make sure I was up on and I had several people tell me something I should have known before. God is as close to me as he can get. He lives within me. John tells us the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit live within me. He is around. He is involved in everything. I, I, it's not up to me to get any closer to him. But it's up to me to be aware of what he's doing to be open to him. And that's the way I want you to approach the gospels. 
God can speak to you through many, many ways. Uh, there are things that happen, and I look back at them and say, ooh, that's got the fingerprint of God all over it. That's got the fingerprint of Jesus all over it. But the Gospels, the, the, the Scripture is, it is the way that he speaks to us. And to be able to read Scripture and let him speak to us from Scripture, and that's what I want. That's how I want to get these Gospels across. The more you know, the more he can tell you. There, there is a way, and, and still chasing my rabbit here. Let me. There, there is a way of uh, of approaching Scripture, where I have an opinion, and I have a question, and I have a. The, I figured it out. Now let me go find a verse of Scripture that backs it up. That is the wrong way to approach Scripture ever. Ever. I want to tell you about, I want to, I want to blame somebody else for this before I tell you. <laughs> um, I tell you about my friend Art Cornett. I went to school with Art. And Art was an interesting person. Uh, he's, a, he's a retired postal worker today in Florida. And um, <clears throat> he would sign all of his papers uh, a work of art. So you could tell what kind of person he was right away. Uh, he, he was always telling you something and he's not gotten any better. His jokes are still just as corny as they used to be. But he told me this one day when I was a freshman in school and he said, Randy, do you know that there's tennis in the Bible? And I said, no, Art, I don't know much about tennis, but I don't think tennis is in the Bible. He said, sure. David served in Pharaoh's court. Tennis in the Bible. There's a motorcycle in the Bible. And he looked at me and I said, Art, there's not a motorcycle in the Bible. And he said, the sound of Pharaoh's triumph was heard throughout the land. There's a motorcycle in the Bible. And there's baseball in the Bible. Where is it? He says the first words of scripture in the beginning. Uh, I had to blame that on him. It's, <laughs> don't you go out here and told, tell them that Randy said there's a motorcycle in the Bible. But what I'm trying to say is you can find what you're looking for. That's taking verses very much out of context but I've been on Facebook lately, and I tell you what, they take verses out of context. <laughs> there are things that they say that they made up their mind, and now they're looking for a verse to back it up. Uh, it, it's one of the things that we just kind of do. And it's, it's not the way to approach Scripture. Let, let the Scripture speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you through the Scripture. And it's amazing what you can learn. I had somebody tell me the other day, I, I read a passage of scripture and I'd never seen that before. It's amazing how God can teach you from passages you've been over time and time before, but he can show you something that you haven't seen before. With that said, I kind of want to go into Mark. Um, a couple of weekends ago, Margaret and I went to Raleigh. We like to go to the farmer's market up there. And I like to go to the restaurant at the farmer's market. <laughs> uh, more than that, uh, good fried chicken, good breakfast. Uh, you know, enjoy going to the farmer's market. Well, if we go to Raleigh, we have to stop by Quail Ridge Bookstore. You know, it's always a requirement that, that we stopped by Quail Ridge Bookstore, and there was a whole bunch of books there, stacked in a corner. And I asked the lady when she rode by, I said, walked by, I said, what in the world are all those books doing over there? She said, well, White Memorial Presbyterian Church is re required that for reading for all of their Christians. And White Memorial is about 4,000 members, so it's, it's pretty big. Um, I saw on the book, it said a foreword by Walter Brueggemann. That's always a good sign. And I said, can I have a copy? 
She said, yeah, you from White Memorial Presbyterian Church? <laughs> I said, no, but it ought to do an Episcopalian okay. You know, so I picked up the book and this book has, it's a good book, I think. I've not finished it yet. Let me tell you later on if it's a good book or not, but it's opened my eyes to some things. One of the things that she says in the book, and it's written by Lisa Harper, one of the things she says in the book is that God's grace and it has always been here. And she goes back to the Babylonian captivity, you know, where they destroy Jerusalem. They take the, you know what I'm talking about, the Babylonian captivity. They take them enslaved to Babylon. And she talks about how much they love the first five books of Moses, what great extent they went to make sure those were preserved. And there's a school of uh, thought that says Genesis took its final form in the Babylonian captivity in those years. I don't know enough to argue that uh, one way or the other. Uh, but they here you have your city torn down, completely torn down, not one stone left upon another, but the Wailing Wall, there's a few stones that can be dated back to this time, but that's it. A society that was never supposed to fall was gone. They were taken by a cruel people, and I decided to leave some of those things off of their cruelty uh, for you, but um, they took them captive over there, and, and there was religion in Babylon, uh, they're Marduk, and, and I could tell you a whole lot, a little bit about, I could tell you a little bit about some of the gods and their beliefs, but it makes the Roman gods make sense. They're, they're more human than not. They're, they're, it's, it's really odd stuff if you take time to read it. But they held on to scripture because in the midst of scripture, in the first chapter of Genesis, which wasn't a chapter yet, but it was the first part of Genesis, they were in the midst of chaos. And God allowed light to shine in the midst of the chaos. We are a people who worship the God who lets light shine in the midst of chaos. And that's one of the reasons they helped. That's grace. They didn't know that Cyrus was going to come along and let part of them go home if they wanted to. But they had the story of the grace of God. We usually don't think about finding grace in the Old Testament. But that's what that, this whole book's about. It's about grace found in the Old Testament. Now, with that in mind, and I've been reading it this week, and I kind of discovered it. And it got me to thinking about John John's question. Uh, the question he asked at the, at the end of uh, the time last time was, we know Luke was written for a particular audience. We'll talk about that. Matthew is written for a particular audience. We'll talk about that. John probably is written for a particular audience. I really want to talk about that. I, I think that's going to be most interesting. Um, but what about Mark? And, and, and Margaret told me on the way home, she said, you never answered that question. And, um, and I didn't because my, my first inclination was he wrote it. Well, I don't know that he had a particular people in mind was, but I don't know that he didn't. And let me tell you how I've kind of come up with this. There's something about Mark that's bothered me. It's bothered me for a long time. Mark is written on a papyrus roll. Now, remember the thing that we call a book where pages are glued together for the central binding was called a codex and it was invented about 325 or 350. It's probably in use by the time we get there. Um, but he has a papyrus roll. How long is a papyrus roll? Does anybody remember how long a papyrus roll was? I told you last week. It, it's about as long as Luke, because Luke is the longest book of the New Testament. 
So front and back, you can get Luke on it. I think that's the reason Luke has two volumes, volume one, Luke, volume two, the book of Acts. And that means that everything he shared about Jesus, everything he shared about Jesus, there's 30 things he had to leave out. Or there's 40 things he had to leave out. Or there's 50 things he had to leave out. There's, there's, if Peter is giving him this story and he's writing it down, every time he puts something in, he has to leave a whole bunch out. Then why did he take two stories that are remarkably similar, take up a large amount of space, and tell those two stories fully? I'm digging into this, so I'm going to share it with you. We, we've still got time in eight weeks to, to go over all of the four Gospels, and I promise you, if we don't do it this time, we'll get into Luke next time. Now, the first one, first of all, does somebody remember the, the only miracle story of Jesus, except the resurrection? The only miracle story that's found in all four Gospels. It was in Tom's sermon three weeks ago. Does anybody remember? Okay, this is going to be on the test. You need to write it down. <laughs> okay, you need to remember this. There's one miracle story found in all four Gospels, including John, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. Okay, the feeding of the 5,000. Now, if we could kind of go over this a little bit. I want to get, um, let's see, where did I write this down so we can find it? It's in the sixth chapter of Mark, and I do want to encourage you, uh, go ahead and bring, bring your Bibles with you, bring some notes with you, uh, a paper. You might hear something that's kind of interesting, and uh, you want to, uh, to write it down. The, um, okay. Let me see. Somehow, can't find my place in the notes where this is written now. Okay. In chapter six, verse 34, as Jesus went ashore, this is, this is part of the five feeding of the 5,000. As he, Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Compassion, splendizoma, very interesting word. It means, literal translation is to be moved with the bowels. That doesn't come across today like it did back then. But, but they thought this was the seed of the emotions. It's what we say when we say moved with the gut. Okay, we're moved in the gut. Because there were, uh, because they are, were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When he, when he grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. The hour is now very late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something to eat. Now, you need to understand that because the disciples aren't saying, go down to Hardy's and get a hamburger. What they are saying is, we can't feed them. Let them go out there and not be fed. I don't want to take blame for this. We're in the political season. Do you ever hear anybody say anything that's really not what they mean? <laughs> but but that's, that's what we have it here. And he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, are we reading this. Are we going to buy 200 denarii worth of bread, and give it to them to eat? That's about two thirds of a year probably. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Uh, go and see. Uh, when they found out, they uh, said, five, two fish. Then he ordered them, okay, that's, an, that's not enough to feed the disciples. Okay. Then he ordered them to get um, all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass and they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. There's 5,000 people plus women and children, probably 15,000 or more, taking the five loaves 
and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the loaves and he gave it to them. And the disciples set uh, his disciples to set before um, the people. Okay. Start again, verse 40, okay. The, the loaves he gave it to the disciples to set before the people and he divided the two fish among them. And they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces and fish. So they took up 12 baskets. It's the word kofinos. It's uh, uh, K-O-F-I-N-O-S is a good transliteration. It's a hand basket. Some versions actually translate it that way. If you're going to work for the day, your wife pass, packs you a lunch pail. That's basically what it is, it's a kofinos. Now, a little later on in chapter eight, something happens again. In those days, uh, there was again a great crowd without anything to eat. And he called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for the crowd. Same thing, feeding of the 4,000 this time, chapter 8, because they have been uh, now three days and had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, okay, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. He said that uh, his disciples replied, how can we feed these people with the bread here in the desert? Basically the same thing. And he answered, how many loaves do you have? And he said, seven. That's not seven, not 12, seven. And they ordered uh, the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven, uh, he took the seven loaves. And after giving thanks, he broke them, gave them to the disciples uh, to distribute. And they distributed uh, them to the crowd. And then they also... Uh, a, they, they had also a few small fish and after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled and they took up broken pieces, left over seven baskets full. Now, I know that Mark's Greek isn't quite as good as Luke, but I don't think he's dumb, you know? And to me, to have a limited amount of space that you're writing, and for everything you put in, you got to leave 30 out to put two things in there that are relatively the same. And there are a lot of people that believe these, these are the same, that they're the same story. He just kind of forgot how many people came and how many baskets, and he told the story again. You see, I just don't see that in Mark, and I don't see that in Peter. Here's what I dug up. The baskets are different. The kafonos, that we have 12 baskets, but here we have the spharos. Now, what is the spharos? Let me, let me talk about that. Acts chapter 9, verse 23, we find it. Um, Acts chapter 9, verse 23. Okay. Acts chapter 9, verse 23. Okay, this is during the life of Paul. And some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill Paul, but their plot was, uh, became known to Paul, and they were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening all in the wall, lowering him in a basket, in a spirus, in a basket. Well, let me tell you, you take a lunch pail, you can't get Paul in it. We've heard that he's short, but you can't get Paul in it. This is a great big basket. This is a basket you could put somebody in, put the top on, let them down, down the wall, and nobody ever see the person in it. This is a big basket. Now, I really hesitated whether I was going to share this today or not, but... I think we have a tremendous two stories. We have a people that are in chaos, <laughs> that, that they're in a place where the Rome rules, 
where the soldiers can come up and demand taxes anytime they want to and say, you carry my packages for X number of, uh, of uh, miles. And decisions were not always good decisions. You had very corrupt power, uh, people in power. And all of a sudden, he gives two stories that I could never figure out why they're there. But they're, your God is the one that provides enough. And he always provides enough. You know, I've been in ministry for 44 years, and we've been married a good hunk of that. God's always provided enough. And I know this is off the subject, but I believe in tithing. You know, Margaret and I have always made that a practice of our marriage, and God has always provided. And sometimes I kind of wondered how that was going to happen. I'd sit down with a checkbook and I, I left this, uh, added it up, and I would say to myself, where, where did that money come from? How did we make it? But God always provides enough. But God's going to give you more than enough. There's just a few years down the road that you're going to learn about Jesus and the resurrection, and you're going to have more than enough. In 314 years, you're going to have conquered the Roman Empire. Christianity is going to become the religion. God is going to give you more than enough, and he does. He just gives you more than enough. And I think that's what Peter was trying to tell us all the time. There's grace here. The God of grace is still with you, even if things don't look good. Okay. Well, I hope that was good for you because I liked it. <laughs> it um, any comments or questions? Yes. Is that story about the loaves and fishes told multiple times in the other gospel? It's the feeding the 5,000 and 4,000 in Matthew. It's not in Luke or John. So, so, so they all had it once, mm -hmm. and Mark and Matthew had it two episodes of it. Right. And Matthew would have been basing a lot of what he wrote on Mark? Probably. Okay. Probably. I'm supposed to repeat the question, am I not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm catching on. Uh, it, are these uh, stories anywhere else? Are, are there in any other Gospels? Uh, the two stories are in Matthew. They're not in Luke. They're not in John. All, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 is in all of them, of course. But, uh, you know, that's what I mean by letting the Scriptures speak to you. Because I think that's when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it and lets you know some things that, are, that you need to know right here, right now. Anyway. Uh, anyway, that's free. Uh, I, I would share with you, and I didn't share with you, uh, Mark, Mark shares 21 Gospels, 21 Gospels, 21 Miracles. So there, there's a lot here uh, that he's trying. Remember, everything he puts in has to leave 30 things out or so. Uh, 21 miracles. Um, it's very interesting to me. Miracle is the word dunamis. Remember what word we get from dunamis? Dynamite. <laughs> power, explosive power. That's a miracle. Um, Mark uses that nine times. He uses the word simeon seven times to describe a miracle. And a miracle there, simeon, is something that points to something else. It's a miracle, but it points to something else. It, it, it tells you another story. And I think this is a good illustration of, of what that is. Now, are there any comments or questions? I've got one maybe. Maybe I've got one. So I think that maybe there's a difference in the type of bread too. So when he's 
miracles and an endless supply. In the Roman Empire, they could only provide a certain amount and try to feed the people. But with just with God, you can feed and be satisfied. So that's where I think that, that's important. Okay. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. It's the barley loaves, I think, yeah. that they, they made at the time. Can you repeat the point for the people that are on the... Can you repeat the point for the people on the... On the Zoom meeting? Okay, John was just making the... And thank you for reminding me. Um, but um, just simply saying that there are different types of bread uh, that the the Romans only provides a certain type of bread. And I think barley loaves, if I recall correctly, are the, uh, the bread that poor people ate. Uh, I think that was, and remember the, the situation here, if hand to mouth, uh, paycheck to paycheck, kind of depends on somebody hires you today, if you get to eat tonight or not. So it's, it's a different kind of, uh, situation. Now, am I about out of time or do I have time to go on a little further? I've got what? Do I really? <laughs> wow, man. I have over a lot of stuff. <clears throat> I want to look at Luke or just at least give you a little bit of an introduction uh, to Luke. Um, and maybe I won't take all of those 20 minutes. That's, that's, that makes us together about an hour. I'll go back to Mark and just a little bit of review. Um, there it is. Um, we, we, you know, I hate not to go over what I went over last week, but it's really important that passage in the last part of Peter where they're all together and what I think is the or, uh, origin of the Gospels. Uh, Mark is, he just happens to be there. Is he the person that you'd look at and say, you're the one, you are talented, you're, you know, Greek well enough, you can do that. No, he isn't at all. He writes the worst Greek in the, in the, in the New Testament. And we showed some of that too. I'll not go back over uh, this time, but um, doesn't God use us that way? We're not the best one to be there at the time, but we're there. And God uses us to touch somebody's life when maybe we ought to call the preacher, the rector, and, and get it handled, but we're there. And, uh, you know, God just does that. that that's, a, that's, a, that's a sermon. That'll preach. Um, but Mark isn't the same person at all. Uh, Luke isn't the same person at all. Luke is a very educated person. Uh, he writes the longest, the longest gospel. He has the best Greek in the New Testament, except for Hebrews. Hebrews is an anomaly. It's written almost in, in classical Greek, but it, uh, he writes very, very well. And while Mark will use the word and again and again and again and again, and the word immediately 11 times in the first chapter, Luke has 700 words, 700 words that are to be found nowhere else in the New Testament. It's going to be on the test. Write it down. That's just, uh, that, that's, that's a good one to remember. Uh, 700 words that, that he's, uh, he's not. Um, that that's used nowhere else. Um, Mark Card, Mark Matthew, Michael Card, Michael Card. You know who I'm talking about? Okay, did uh, maybe a generational thing. <laughs> um, did El Shaddai? Is that Amy Grant? Did Amy Amy Grant sing it? Doesn't strike you, uh, Michael Card. Um, Michael Card does some really tremendous New Testament work. Uh, and he explains it in a way that's easily understood, which I don't always. 
Um, he's, he's been hired by the day of discovery, does a lot of their, their stuff. Uh, um, Margaret and I were having lunch with Michael and the question was asked somewhere, you are so talented. I think he, the, I read last night, he's published 111 songs. You're so talented and he has a folkish, uh, type of music, folk type music. And then you teach so well. Uh, how do you get the division here? And, and he said, I write the songs to make money so I can teach the scriptures. I thought that was fantastic. But anyway, it was Michael Card, and I'm relying on him. Uh, when he says it, that Luke is a journey, uh, Luke is a journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Book of Acts is a story from Jerusalem to Rome. It's pretty much true. Um, 951, that is the key verse in Luke. Luke 951. You can also write that down. That's when the disciples looked at Jesus and said, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I, I think that's the turning point of the whole book. And nobody else shares anything, anything like that. To know a little bit about him, let me go to Timothy. If I haven't moved it, it uh, okay. Second Timothy four nine. Second Timothy four nine. Paul is, of course, writing, and he says, do your best to come to me, speaking to Timothy soon, for Demas uh, in the love of the present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Croesus has gone to, excuse me, uh, I read it wrong. Demas in love with the present world has departed me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. To me, that tells you all about Luke you need to know. In a day where he's in jail, to have Luke, the only one that would stick there with him and stay there with him, that's in danger to him, his own self. He is a physician. We're told that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. I may not look that up, uh, but he is a physician. Uh, uh, a lot of books have been written on the medical terms that are used in Luke. Um, that, that's worth studying. Um, he's a very well-educated person. I've already pointed that out. Um, using 700 words is found nowhere else. <clears throat> if somebody were to ask you who wrote the most of the New Testament, you would say, Paul, oh, Luke, if you count the number of letters, it's Paul. If you count the volume of writing, it's Luke. If you count Luke and Acts, Luke wrote 28% of the New Testament. Paul wrote 24% of the New Testament. So you know, that's important. The reason for his writing, and, and I may need to go over some of this next week. The reason for his writing, <clears throat> And I'm probably going to stop with this. He writes to the Gentiles. He writes to the Gentiles. He said, those people over in Galatia, I need to write so they can understand. Those people over in Colossian, Colossae, I need to write so they can understand. So he writes differently. He tells the same story. If you were telling a story to a 50-year-old, and then you turned around and told a story to a 12-year-old, would you tell it differently? Would you tell it differently? It'd still be the same story. So there's the word rabbi. Certainly use of Jonas. That doesn't appear in Luke. It doesn't appear one time in Luke. Why? Those people he's writing to don't know what a rabbi is. That They know that the Jews have one, but they don't know what one is. He's writing to those people. 
The term Golgotha. <clears throat> Golgotha is written, Golgotha. It's a word that appears in multiple gospels. It doesn't appear in Luke. Why? We believe Ryan too wouldn't know what a Golgotha was. That's a Hebrew word anyway. And, and just, just he uses that way. And I want to share with you, and I may stop with this. I want to share with you a story. Mark chapter 2, verse 3. Mark chapter 2, verse 3. Hope I've got that right. Yes, there we go. Then some people came bringing him a paralyzed man, bringing Jesus a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. When they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through the roof, they led him in a mat. They let him down on a mat and uh, on which the paralyzed I mean, like, so they dug through the roof. Listen to Luke tell the story. Luke 5, 17. Luke 5, 17. Okay, Luke 5, 17. Now listen to this and see if you can, can hear the difference. One day, while they were teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting uh, nearby. They had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal. We'll talk about that. That's, uh, that's an interesting statement. Just then, some men came carrying a paralytic man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the middle of the crowd. Not a lot of difference, but those people he's writing to don't know what a, roof, a dirt roof is. Who's right? Probably Mark. They dug through the roof. The, the, the dirt roof was how they did things. I mean, it, their, their roofs were like that. If you get over into Roman areas, Thessalonica, Colossae, those places, they don't know what a dirt roof is. So to be able to tell them they dug through the roof, if I were to tell you I'm going home and dig through my roof, you'd think I was crazy. And, you know, the same thing, Luke would have thought the same thing. We've got to tell this in a way that those people can hear the story. And so he, uh, those are just three things, but he adjusts the story, not to change it, but he adjusts the story to tell the Gentiles. Matthew will adjust the story to tell the Jews. And now, I wanted you to see that. I think that is the reason for Luke. I do think that Luke is the second book written, the second of the gospels. Now remember, all of Paul's letters are already written, but the second of the Gospels. Now, I can without a doubt tell you that Mark was the first, but that Luke was the second. I can't put the nail through the coffin. I can't make that work, but I think it is, and, and I'll share with you when we go along. And again, don't go out and tell them I told you motorcycles are in the Bible. So <laughs> we're going to pause with that and uh, stop and kind of pick up there next week. Okay. Yes. Was there a two question? If the Gospel of Mark was written first, how is it the belief to meet Gospel? And second, would Mark have seen or listened to Jesus on any occasion? The Gospel of if the Gospel of Mark were written first. How is it the least unique of the Gospels? <clears throat> the reason is the, 
is because Matthew and Luke are copying it. And I left that, that may be in your, your notes um, uh, that uh, Tom passed out. But, uh, you know, Matthew copies 606 verses. I don't remember the verses exactly. Nope. The, um, but that's the reason it's the least unique. Most unique, of course, is John. As John, do they have Mark in hand? No doubt. Would Mark have listened to Jesus on any occasion? Probably. It's hard to believe that he didn't. Was he with them during the ministry? There's no indication of that at all. But, um, okay, how can I make this go away? Well, that, that's the, okay, Matthew has 1,068 verses, Mark has 661, so Matthew quotes 606 of the verses. Not only does he quote them, he cleans up his grammar. And you never go to somebody and copy them and mess up their grammar. You know, you do it the other way. So do, do we know that for sure? Um, I don't have this written down, so Tom, you can help me. But they had the upper, the, the, the last supper in the upper room, which was Mark's house, was it not? Do we know that? I don't remember, I don't remember either. Um, but, but Mark was there. It's certainly a traveling companion to Paul. Uh, Paul and so. Okay, do we have others? Did I did I answer that question? Hope I did. Would Mark have been seen or listened to Jesus on any occasion? Well, see, we just don't have that information. Probably. <clears throat> the answer is probably. Would Mark have seen uh, and heard the messages of Jesus? Probably. Um, but we don't have anywhere that says so specifically. Okay. If you don't mind, I'd like to close us out with a word of prayer. May the Lord be with you. Also, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And the more we dig in it, the more we find it's there. And thank you for those that have gathered today here and have gathered uh, at home to watch this via Zoom. And uh, we ask your blessing to be upon the class as we continue to look at Luke and Matthew and, and the other Gospels as well. So, Father, be with us. Make this uh, week a, a, a week of blessing in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Brand, could you give us the title and the author of the book you held up that you had gotten from Clover and your wife so much? I have read the half of it and half of it's real good. <laughs> so I've done that before and then I read the last half of the book and I said, oh no. <laughs> well, this book is called a the very good gospel. The very good gospel. The very good gospel. And it is written by Lisa Harper. And basically the theme is grace and good news is throughout the Old Testament as well. But you can find it everywhere. Okay. All right, thank you. Sure. And if I go to Quail Ridge Book and pretend to be Baptist, I can get a free Presbyterian. <laughs> that's right. Whatever. Uh, that's good. That's fine. Thank you, Randy.